Thanks a lot, Benjamin, for uh, including my paper in this uh, uh, really exciting session. Um, I will present a paper on uh, stable coins that tries to analyze uh, the determinants of uh, stability and uh, adoption. Um, what are stable coins? So stable coins are the uh, latest innovation in the history of private money. They promise a stable and secure way for crypto investors um, to park their funds to reduce, uh, to reduce trading costs ac across currency exchanges, across cryptocurrency exchanges, um, and uh, recently also to earn interest. However, there are also potential use cases going forward for uh, low-cost remittances, for instance. Uh, like other crypto assets, stable coins uh, build on decentralized blockchain technologies, uh, but unlike uh, Bitcoin or eth Ether, uh, they don't have, uh, uh, that don't have intrinsic value and are highly volatile. The uh, stable coins instead are packed to a fiat currency, typically to the US dollar. Um, and they are, uh, in case of the leading stable coins, um, backed by traditional financial assets um, and also to some extent by other crypto assets. Um, during the last years, uh, the market for stable coins has expanded very rapidly. Um, and it has also become a top area of uh, uh, regulatory focus. Um, that has started with the uh, uh, now um, discontinued Facebook Libra project, uh, but has also continued. And uh, uh, one of the reasons, for instance, is that there is a growing concern uh, that there could be financial stability risk for the broader financial system, for instance, because of the role of uh, stablecoin issues in the money market and Benoit will I think tell uh, us a little bit more about that. Um, like banks and money market funds, uh, stablecoin issues face the risk of uh, runs and uh, coin holders are sensitive to uh, adverse information. Um, the uh, key questions that I will um, try to address in this paper are first, how is uh, stablecoin fragility affected by adoption? Uh, what determines the interplay between the two, between stability and adoption? Second, uh, what is the role of uh, crypto investor heterogeneity, network effects, transaction fees, and uh, stablecoin lending? And third, um, how is adoption and fragility affected by monetary policy, by competition with traditional banks who offer another form of uh, private money, and potentially by changes in regulation? Um, since this is the first presentation in the session, I thought to show you something briefly about the uh, uh, market uh, to fix ideas. So what you can see here is the um, uh, development of the stablecoin market since January 2020. Um, so you see the market capitalization of the uh, top uh, stablecoins. They are all packed to the US dollar. Um, you can first see that the market expanded very rapidly, especially in the last year, in 2021. Second, you can see that the market is uh, uh, dominated by uh, three issues, by uh, Tether, uh, by US dollar coin, and by Binance coin. Um, these three are uh, fully backed stable coins, and the issues claim that uh, the assets are mostly comprising traditional financial assets denominated in US dollars that have a high quality and uh, liquidity. So you could see this uh, stablecoin issues in a way similar to money market funds or narrow banks. Um, third, you can see that uh, uh, the market uh, uh, suffered a substantial correction in uh, May, June 2020. That was the period of crypto market turmoil it also affected the stable coins market, and you can see that uh, the uh, fifth uh, 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 biggest uh, stable coin, uh, Terra US dollar, in terms of the fifth biggest in terms of market capitalization, um, failed back then. Uh, Terra uh, is a algorithmic stable coin. It's, uh, uh, it was not a fully backed stable coin. Um, and during that period, you also see that the largest stable coin, Tether, a fully backed stable coin, um, also experienced uh, sustained outflows. Since then it recovered somewhat and uh, there was a brief period when it was also breaching the pack, but uh, since then it has traded again in a narrow band around the pack. Uh, what I will talk in, uh, about in this paper is um, I will present the theoretical framework that is probably best suited to analyze this uh, dominant fully backed stable coins. Um, 
from the viewpoint of the coin holders, um, what are they concerned about? Uh, for them, it's clear that it may not always be possible to redeem their coins at par. Uh, most importantly, it's hard for them to assess the asset risk and uh, uh, the liquidity risk uh, that the issuer faces. Uh, moreover, there might be operational risks and technological risks. Think, for instance, of uh, cyber risks that could negatively affect the profitability of the issuer. Um, if we have a look at the uh, um, uh, asset breakdown of the largest US stablecoin Tether um, for March 2020, that's the latest available date when Tether was in a way self-reporting uh, uh, its assets. Um, we can see that there are, are um, uh, lots of assets that um, are potentially uh, um, quite risky and exposed to some liquidity risk. You can see some lower rated commercial paper, you can see some um, secured loans where we don't know the quality um, are corporate bonds and you can even see non-alternative uh, investments like, like Bitcoin for instance digital tokens and I was using some color coding here so the areas that are most risky I believe are, are in red but the information we have is not particularly good and that's pretty much as far as transparency goes for instance, I also labeled the bank deposits in orange because actually we don't know uh, which banks are the counterparties. There are rumors that it's mostly Chinese banks, so they are uh, uh, um, uh, not regulated by U.S. regulators. There's uninsured deposits of, of unclear quality. Um, what I will do in this paper, I will build uh, on the uh, uh, global, bank, uh, global Games Bank Run and Currency Attack models and will uh, uh, modify them for the context uh, of the stablecoins market. Um, one paper in this literature that I will particularly build on is uh, uh, Sarkovic and Steiner, 2012 in the AER, who look at a global games model with heterogeneous payoffs, which is going to be important for me because I have a model with heterogeneous uh, cryptocurrency investors. Um, then there's other related literature on uh, adoption of monies, and also very recently literature on stable coins that uh, Kent I will tell you later more about. Um, let's come to the model. Um, it's a model with two periods. There are three dates, zero, one, and two, and there's a continuum of uh, risk-neutral investors. Uh, there's at date zero an adoption gain. At date zero, the investors, they decide whether to adopt stable coins or instead uh, um, uh, invest their funds in deposits or cash. And at date one, there is a conversion game where the ones who invested in stable coins, the coin holders, they decide simultaneously whether to uh, demand conversion of their coins into cash or not. Um, and that's modeled uh, pretty similar to a, a global games bank run model. Um, my framework has three key features. The first feature is that uh, investors, they consume at the end of the game, at day two, and they are uncertain about the preferred payment method. So uh, there's going to be a seller of the consumption good, uh, or many sellers of the consumption good, and the investors they know they are going to be randomly matched with the sellers, and they know that the sellers are uh, going to have a preferred payment method that they accept for payment for the consumption good, um, so they know that the seller is only accepting uh, stable coins with probability alpha, only accepting bank deposits or cash with probability beta, and with probability one minus alpha beta, uh, um, the seller accepts um, all means of payment. The second key feature is that investors differ in their convenience benefit, BG, um, that, they enjoy, that they enjoy from holding stable coins instead of uh, bank deposits or cash, and I assume that there is a, um, a potentially large number uh, G of different groups, um, and uh, the mass of the groups uh, adds up to one, to unity. Um, so this model feature is meant to capture that crypto investors are in practice quite heterogeneous. Uh, why is that? Um, well, because they have different preferences. Some have preferences for anonymity, others are uh, by preference crypto enthusiasts, um, others have uh, some uh, relatively higher convenience from holding crypto assets because they are interested in certain use cases um, such as remittance payments or possibly some illicit use cases as well. 
So uh, if you think about this parameter B that is uh, capturing that in, in a crude way and uh, the uh, investors with a high B, you can think of them as the crypto enthusiasts and with a low, uh, with a zero or negative B, um, that's going to be the, um, for instance, uh, your uh, uh, grandma, the, the older investors that don't have a high technological affinity and they would be quite averse to adopt stable coins, right? The uh, third feature, uh, which is common to the Global Games Bank Run and Currency Attack literature, is that the stablecoin issue's profitability is stochastic and is governed by some fundamental theta, but the investors, the coin holders, they have incomplete information about that. They receive a private signal which comprises theta plus some idiosyncratic error term that doesn't depend on the group they belong to. Um, then let's come to the stablecoin issuer. The issuer um, offers to convert um, cash into a digital token, the stablecoin, and vice versa uh, at a one-to-one -one conversion rate at dates zero, one, and two. So at each date, um, she offers uh, this one-to-one -one conversion rate. However, there are uh, potentially some uh, transaction costs. We model them as proportional transaction costs that are, for most of the model, taken, uh, uh, for most of this talk, also taken uh, as given uh, exogenously, um, tau zero, tau one, and tau two for, for the different dates. Um, and um, uh, the investors, they know that their investments in stable coins are risky. The uh, issuer may not always be able to keep her promise uh, to have the one-to-one -one con uh, version. Um, and uh, how does this look like? Well. The uh, um, investors, they give the funds to the uh, issuer if they adopt the stablecoin at date zero. Uh, the stablecoin issuer makes a risky investment that pays off uh, theta units of cash at day two, where theta is a random variable that is uniformly distributed uh, um, in the support from theta lower bar to theta upper bar. Theta lower bar is below one, theta upper bar above one, so we're gonna get a situation where for low realizations of theta, it's gonna be hard for the issuer to keep her promise and for high realizations of theta it's gonna be easy. Uh, moreover, uh, same as in the bank run literature, we assume that there is, uh, uh, that premature uh, liquidation at date one yields a lower return, little r, which is smaller than one and also smaller than the P1 is the payment promise to uh, 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 investors, to coin holders who are demanding at date one conversion. Um, and we, um, assume that uh, for some sufficiently high realizations of the fundamental, for high realizations of theta, there is actually a higher uh, uh, return on premature liquidation. And that's a modeling trick that uh, I adopt from a paper by Goldstein and Pautzner that I had on the previous literature introduction slide, which is gonna uh, allow us uh, uh, to uh, um, more easily uh, uh, derive equilibrium existence and uniqueness. Uh, the model is solved backwards, so let's first have a look at the conversion game. So uh, uh, the conversion game looks as follows. Um, the coin holders, they receive their private signal XI, which is correlated to the fundamental realization theta that they want to learn about. Um, they either choose the action uh, zero, which means they keep their stable coins. Uh, remember that they converted at date zero their cash into stable coins. And uh, that means they have one minus tau zero units of stable coins where tau zero is a potentially positive transaction cost. Could also be zero in my model, that's no problem. Uh, the alternative action, uh, one is to demand conversion to P1 units of cash where P1 is the po promised repayment. So that's gonna be basically one minus tau zero times one minus tau one. Uh, what does the coin holder think about uh, when taking this decision? Well, they are concerned about the issues fundamental. They have to make their assessment based on their private signal uh, what theta could be. Uh, moreover, they form beliefs about uh, the uh, proportion A uh, of investors demanding conversion. So A is basically just the integral over the um, action of the individual coin holders divided by N, which is the adoption rate, which, we like, which I will talk about later. It's going to turn out that the uh, coin holders with a unfavorable signal with a low XI, they're going to demand conversion and the coin holders with a favorable signal uh, are going to not demand conversion of the coin. 
and uh, it's going to turn out that there is a critical threshold which is going to be group specific. Um, so what are the determinants of fragility graphically? Um, what I show you here in this graph is uh, I show you the differential payoff from demanding conversion. So that's the payoff from demanding conversion minus the payoff from not demanding conversion. Um, and on the horizontal axis, you have the aggregate conversion demand in the economy at date one. So whenever um, A is low, meaning that few investors, a few stable coin holders demand conversion, uh, it's going to be the case that the issuer is able to uh, meet the redemption requests. In this case, the issuer is solvent, um, and the differential payoff from demanding conversion is negative. Why is that? Uh, because if the issuer is solvent, it's better to keep the stable coin because you invested in the stable coin in the first place, so you find it beneficial to keep it as well. Um, then there's going to be some critical threshold A hat, which is uh, um, the condition that is governing uh, solvency of the issuer. So whenever uh, too many are demanding conversion in the aggregate, whenever A is larger than this threshold, we're going to have that the issuer is insolvent. So how does this threshold depend on uh, key model uh, variables? So uh, remember theta is going to be the fundamental. So whenever the fundamental is stronger, whenever theta is better, the issue is more resilient. What is that going to mean? That's going to mean that uh, this threshold is moving to the right. The region of solvency is bigger. Um, and uh, the opposite is the case if the liquidation value R is smaller and uh, is also the case if the promise P1 is larger. Then this threshold is moving to the left. Um, then what happens under insolvency? Under insolvency, we have to distinguish between two different regions when we look at this uh, shape of delta. And I cannot go into that in all detail. Um, but uh, what's going to be uh, 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 of interest here is how this delta basically depends on the different model parameters. Because that's going to tell us what the determinants of uh, fragility are. Um, and um, what we see here is uh, that um, the uh, uh, delta is depending uh, negatively on the uh, fundamental theta. So if the issue is more resilient, this differential payoff from this withdrawing is shifting down. Um, and uh, the same is the case if uh, the individual coin holder has a higher convenience benefit, benefit from stable coin. That's also quite intuitive. And the same is the case if alpha is larger. That means if the uh, consumption good seller is more likely to accept stable coins. That makes you also more willing to, to keep them instead of converting them. Uh, the opposite is the case if, for instance, beta is larger, which is the probability that the uh, consumption good seller only accepts uh, a cash or bank deposits. Um, so when um, thinking about whether to um, demand conversion or not, the individual coin holders, they are basically forming their uh, expectation um, about this uh, uh, function here and uh, decide um, based on their individual type and private signal uh, their expectation about theta and the uh, co aggregate conversion demand capital A whether to demand conversion or not. And uh, that's what we uh, uh, find when we solve for the equilibrium. Uh, essentially what we find, what is the key here is that there exists a um, uh, unique threshold um, uh, below which coin holders are demanding conversion and this signal threshold is group specific so whenever uh, an individual belonging to group G uh, receives a private signal that is below us some threshold X star that is indexed with the group um, then they are demanding conversion whenever the signal is higher they don't demand conversion and there's going to exist some fundamental threshold, theta star, whenever the fundamental realization is below that, uh, there's going to be a run, and um, the issuer is going to be insolvent, and if it's above that, there's not going to be a run. And what you see here is, in a way, uh, some um, uh, version of this uh, function delta, and you can see three different integrals that are, in a way, the three different regions that you saw in the graph, basically, uh, that we have here. Um, and um, and uh, the reason why uh, this can be solved so neatly uh, is uh, because it turns out 
that for the case of vanishing private noise, when epsilon goes to zero, we have that the uh, individual signal thresholds, they are clustering uh, around the fundamental threshold and uh, essentially the uh, whole heterogeneity we can summarize in this B upper bar which is in a way some sort of weighted average of the convenient benefits over the different groups. And by doing that we can then basically also see uh, one of the first insights that um, this uh, B is um, negatively associated with theta star meaning that whenever the average convenient benefit uh, of the coin holders is higher, um, the uh, issuer uh, is more stable, which is intuitive. And uh, an implication of that is uh, when we come to stable coin adoption, if it's the ca it's case that the stable coin is uh, tapping a narrow market segment, say only the crypto enthusiasts, it's going to be more stable because these are going to be less flighty investors. But whenever the stable coin issuer is tapping broader market segments, uh, then the marginal investor is going to change and is going to become more flighty. And that's going to be reflected in the relationship between this B upper bar and the theta star. Um, let's come uh, to the adoption game, um, where uh, investors at date zero decide whether to adopt the stable coin in the first place or not. Uh, so the investors, uh, they belong to different groups. And uh, if they choose the action one, they adopt this stable coin, they convert their funds into one minus tau zero units of the stable coin. If they don't, they uh, either place their money in cash or in bank deposits. They prefer uh, insured bank deposits. I think I didn't say that before. So the bank here is basically very simple. It's insured bank deposits. They prefer that whenever the return on bank deposits is larger than one, that's clear. Otherwise they go for cash. Uh, and uh, what do they think about when solving this problem? Well, they think how likely is it that cash or deposits uh, or stable coins are going to be the preferred payment method when I buy my consumption good at the end of the game and how stable is the stable coin. And uh, when we solve this, we can see that if there are no network externalities, which I model basically uh, as a potential dependence of the uh, probability alpha, uh, that the sellers only accept stable coins uh, on the uh, adoption rate. Uh, so if there is no network externalities, we have a unique equilibrium of this adoption game. If there is network externalities, meaning that the sellers are more likely to accept stable coins if stable coins are adopted by more agents in the economy, then I can have multiple equilibria. And this multiple equilibria are going to be uh, indexed by the um, coin holders by the, by the investors' beliefs about the stability. So if they believe actually, well, the stable coin issue is not very stable, then uh, uh, there's lower adoption. If they believe it's going to be more stable, there's higher adoption. So now if we uh, look at some more comparative statics and extension of these models, um, we can uh, uh, first uh, 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 look a little bit at factors that are affecting the profitability of the issuer, which is going to be tightly linked to the um, uh, stability of the issuer and also to adoption and then also related aspects uh, about issuance policy and also about monetary policy. So when we look at uh, um, the uh, incidence of runs, uh, we can see that uh, uh, anything that increases the profitability of the issuer um, is uh, lowering the incidence of runs. Um, and uh, aspects that we could uh, 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 think about here uh, and put in the model is some fixed costs of operation. So of course the fixed costs of operation are going to uh, uh, increase the, the risk of runs. Um, and uh, if it's the case that part of the transaction fees are not accrued by the issuer but maybe go to uh, uh, other intermediaries or to, to miners, then of course that also negatively affects the profitability. Um, we can look at uh, this transaction fees in a little bit more detail and make them endogenous. And uh, then we can see that if the issue has a possibility to affect this transaction fees, it's actually quite good to make them high at the intermediate date uh, because this is disincentivizing uh, uh, runs. And um, that's also a feature that is a little bit in, uh, built into this uh, uh, um, uh, decentralized ledger, ledger technologies because uh, what we have here is that in periods of high transaction demand, at least for on-chain transaction, the transaction 
uh, costs are going up a lot, which is a stabilizing factor. And that's quite similar to, to um, for instance, what you have with swing pricing with money market funds. So, so that's not something really new here. But that's also something that we find here. And here it's based on uh, uh, the technology uh, that is used, this effect. Then coming to monetary policy, uh, we can see that the lower monetary policy rate uh, might arguably affect the bank deposits. Uh, if a lower policy rate causes bank deposit rates to be lower, that is actually increasing the incentives to hold stable coins um, because the relative return of bank deposit goes down, uh, so it might increase adoption. Uh, and then it depends on uh, whether the additional stable coin adopters are uh, much more flighty or not. If they are much more flighty uh, than the existing ones, you uh, um, might reduce stability, otherwise you increase stability. Um, if you, however, think about a scenario where, lower, uh, where monetary policy rates are lower for longer, uh, then uh, that arguably also affects the remunerations on the asset side of the issuer, um, and uh, that is reducing stability. And that's pretty similar to the uh, float man management problem of money market funds with uh, persistent low rates. Uh, then what I do in another extension to this model, I introduce a stable coins lending market. That's something that has developed primarily uh, in the last uh, half a year or nine months in the stable coins universe. Um, and uh, I find that uh, generally, the introduction of the stable coins lending market can uh, promote adoption and stability. Uh, it's, if you wish, increasing the uh, service value of the stable coin. Um, it's making it more attractive to hold the stable coin. Um, however, if this, uh, um, if this uh, fact that there is a stable coin lending market is allowing uh, speculators to uh, borrow lots of stable coins in order to speculate against the issuer, then actually it can backfire and can reduce stability. Um, let me conclude. Uh, I'm already running out of time. So uh, the stable coin uh, market is a new interesting market. It has been expanding rapidly uh, during the last two years. Uh, it is prone to instability. There has been a, a, a bigger run recently where almost 20 billion were wiped out. Um, the uh, stablecoin market may pose, uh, pose broader financial stability risks going forward. That's why the regulatory community, community and central banks are concerned about it. Uh, there are existing theories to study bank runs and currency attacks that can be modified to incorporate specific aspects that are different in the stablecoins market, different to the traditional uh, banking contexts. And that's the avenue that I take here in this paper. I uh, use this existing global games uh, brain gun and currency attack models and uh, put some additional ingredients in there that try to capture these new market features. And in doing so, I try to study the determinants of stable coin adoption and fragility as well as the potential interplay between the two. Thanks a lot for your attention. And now for something slightly different, uh, which is a paper on CBDC. Um, so you look at the program and you think, oh, uh, the Lithuanians uh, can't even spell stable coins, but we put a space in there uh, kind of to make it a little bit more broad, uh, the session. But no one apart from me uh, took up the offer. So um, yeah, just as a quick, uh, motivation, you know, CBDCs are being actively discussed in most central banks, so I hope this audience doesn't need uh, too much kind of uh, convincing that this is an interesting topic. Um, the focus of this paper is going to be on uh, the effect of introducing CP CDB uh, CBDC on the market for deposits, um, and also kind of the interbank market, but more broadly bank liquidity. Um, so the features of CBDC that I wanted to capture are that uh, CBDC I see as a closer substitute to bank deposits than physical currency. Um, the central bank sets, its, sets the remuneration rate exogenously, so it's not 
profit maximizing and it's not you know, intentionally competing with, um, with banks in the deposit space. Um, and then the, the third point that I, is kind of the key uh, element of this paper is that the central bank doesn't use the interbank market. So essentially, if there's liquidity uh, differentials between a CBDC and the banking sector, uh, rather than you know, uh, having uh, use of the interbank market, uh, the CBDC is going to cause an increased use of standing facilities. So the framework uh, is a little bit IO inspired. So there's imperfect competition between a finite number of banks and uh, CBDC. Uh, the deposit market is modeled as a salop circle. Um, the liquidity shock uh, generates a cost of deposits, um, which is increasing in CBDC market share. Okay, so this is kind of one of the key um, parts of the model. And the model predicts, uh, because it's the Salop Circle framework, different short run effects where the number of banks is fixed and long run effects where the number of banks uh, changes. So there's obviously a large uh, literature on CBDC already. Uh, this is obviously not an exhaustive list. Uh, there are also models of uh, the interbank market, which uh, I lean on quite heavily. And this isn't the first paper to look at the impact of uh, CBDC on deposit market, uh, but I think it's one of the first uh, to look at it in, in this kind of uh, salad circle uh, kind of framework. So there are uh, three different agents in this model. So depositors, as I said before, uh, a unit mass uh, located around a salad circle. Um, they can choose to deposit funds at uh, a retail bank, and they pay this uh, linear transport cost TB depending on their uh, distance from uh, the bank. Or they can deposit in CBDC if the central bank um, uh, chooses to introduce it. And there, I introduce this random transport cost uh, where the central bank transport cost is fixed. It doesn't depend on, on where the depositors uh, are located around the circle, but each depositor has uh, some random uh, transport cost between zero and, and the bank transport cost. And essentially, the idea is similar to uh, Christoph's assumption on, on the stablecoin preferences, right? People are going to have very different um, views on CBDC. They're going to have extra dimensions uh, relative to retail banks of whether they would want to adopt it. Right? Privacy concerns, uh, obviously, um, one of the big issues, but also you know, the possible higher stability of having a, a central bank-backed uh, digital currency versus retail bank deposits. So there are going to be uh, uh, at least two banks located, uh, and these banks locate uh, evenly spaced around the circle, and they have to pay a fixed cost. Uh, to enter. Um, they raise uh, some exogenous quantity of liquidity, L, so this is uh, you know, a very simple motiva motivation for why banks need to uh, or would want to enter the deposit market. Uh, they obtain uh, liquidity from the central bank, um, and they can do so. So this is a, uh, essentially a three-period model. So in the first period, they enter. In the second period, they can obtain um, liquidity from the central bank through open market operations. And in the second period, they also uh, set a deposit rate and so collect retail deposits. Um, but they can also obtain liquidity from the central bank in the third period, which is after these liquidity shocks are realized. And this is where uh, they, they have to use the standing facilities. Right? So open market operations are only available in the second period, not the final period. Um, yeah, and banks set uh, deposit rate to maximize profits. Central bank chooses uh, whether or not to introduce a CBDC, um, and it sets uh, the remuneration rate on CBDC uh, if it in introduces it, as well as the, the, uh, the three essential interest rates, which is the main policy rate, the, refin um, the open market operations rate, uh, and then 
the interest rate on the deposit facility and the lending facility, which the bank accesses in the final period. And obviously, there's a spread between the facility rates and the main policy rate. So there's essentially a penalty cost of uh, using these standing facilities. OK, so the timing uh, I've already kind of um, said, but I'll just briefly go over it. So entry happens in period one. In period two, um, banks choose their open market operation liquidity and the deposit rate, which essentially pins down their, uh, the quantity of, of deposits uh, they obtain. Okay. Uh, it also pins down the quantity of uh, CBDC market share uh, in the second period. And then this liquidity shock hits, uh, and I'll go into more detail about how this is modeled. And then if banks have a liquidity shortfall, they have to return to a neutral liquidity position through either the interbank market or the use of the standing facilities. Okay, and the model is solved backwards. Um, so the liquidity shock, this happens in the uh, third period. Um, and essentially, there's going to be uh, a discrete aggregate shock to the banking sector. So with probability 1 minus uh, lambda, some fraction of all depositors relocate around the circle, and their relocation is uh, uh, uniform around the circle. So essentially, um, the law of large numbers holds and nothing happens, right? Because all banks will have the same liquidity inflows and outflows, and they won't have uh, any change in their liquidity deficit. With probability lambda, a fraction of bank depositors relocate around the circle, but the CBDC depositors stay the same. Okay, so this is, if you like, a little bit like the um, bank-run CBDC literature, but here the focus is not on, um, on bank runs uh, and banks exiting per se. It's, it's more just about um, a loss of liquidity, so a liquidity run, if you like, which banks are able to obtain additional liquidity, it's just going to be costly. Right? So this isn't about banks necessarily failing, just bank liquidity costs increasing. Um, so yeah, so because of the law of large numbers, uh, with probability 1 minus lambda, nothing happens, which means that uh, the bank will essentially have a liquidity deficit if they didn't obtain enough liquidity from the central bank and, or they don't have enough market share. Um, but in equilibrium, this is, uh, you can think of this uh, in the benchmark model as being zero, right? Because banks are going to um, have, uh, aren't going to necessarily want to start with a deficit in all periods. Um, and then um, with probability lambda, the, uh, the banks are going to have larger outflows of liquidity than inflows, so they're going to have a positive uh, liquidity deficit. And the size of the liquidity deficit depends on the market share of CBDC, okay? Um, because of the structure of the shock. Um, and this is essentially going to, in e equilibrium, generate this expected cost of uh, deposits, which is uh, essentially in equilibrium, the, the, if you ignore this liquidity risk, then the cost of deposits, uh, or sorry, the, the liquidity cost of deposits will equal the uh, policy rate um, because there's this, uh, interbank market that pins everything down. And then the second term is essentially the additional liquidity uh, cost of CBDC. Uh, and this is going to be increasing in, uh, obviously, the probability and size of the shock, but also the CBDC's market share. OK, so the, the deposit market, uh, there's a standard uh, Salop circle demand equation. So the marginal depositor located at distant x uh, between bank i and i plus 1 is going to uh, choose to deposit in bank i if the deposit rate is sufficiently larger than um, uh, i plus 1's deposit rate uh, conditional near distant. Okay, and obviously, I focus on the symmetric equilibrium where all banks uh, charge the same deposit rate. Um, the introduction of CBDC is slightly different. Um, there's this uh, 
uh, random transport cost, and the marginal distance uh, depositor is going to locate um, a distance x from bank uh, from the ba uh, from bank i, which depends on obviously their location, the the deposit rate, and the uh, CBDC remuneration rate, and also this random transport cost. Okay, so again, I'm going to use the law of large numbers. So essentially, CBDC is going to take um, assuming that this uh, remuneration rate is sufficiently high, some fraction of uh, depositors from the CBDC. Okay, so there's, um, there are going to be two important cutoffs here. So obviously, if the CBDC remuneration rate is sufficiently low, uh, everyone will just deposit at a bank and uh, no one will adopt CBDC. Uh, if the remuneration rate is sufficiently high, um, then banks will no longer compete against each other for depositors. Okay, this isn't the same as banks necessarily being driven out altogether, but it results in a case where banks will only compete against the CBDC. They will operate a local uh, monopoly in the sense that they, they locate in a segment of the circle and they're not directly competing with their neighbor bank. So this is a case that I, I essentially um, rule out by uh, restrictions on the uh, remuneration rate, and I say central banks wouldn't want this to happen. It's, it's if you like, a, a bad outcome that's planned against. Okay, so um, in terms of the implications of introducing a CBDC, um, so we can think of the case where CBDC is always introduced, and then um, the remuneration rate is the important policy tool, right? Because if you set the remuneration rate sufficiently low, then it's like he didn't introduce CBDC uh, at all. Here, I'm, I'm looking at the case without liquidity shock. So this is purely just the, the IO part of the model. Um, and there's, if you like, uh, three important uh, points to emphasize. So the deposit rate is obviously going to be increasing uh, monotonically in uh, the CBDC remuneration rate. So there's some pass through, at least in the short run, of in increasing the CBDC remuneration rate on bank deposits. Um, but this pass through is not going to be uh, 100%, um, uh, which makes sense. Um, and there's also this discontinuity, uh, uh, not this, uh, this kink in the in, um, in the response, which is um, uh, yeah, not, not necessarily a, it's just a feature of uh, the, the demand structure. Um, but essentially, introducing CBDC will um, result in bank market sharings falling, and obviously, bank profits falling uh, as well. And you know, the mechanism should be relatively Obviously, CBDC provides additional uh, competition with the banks, and banks want to raise uh, deposit rates in order uh, to compete with these depositors. Um, yeah, and obviously, having to raise the deposit rate and having a lower market share is going to reduce bank, uh, bank profit. So what happens in the long run? So in the long run, obviously, the number of banks is going to fall um, as, bank, as the banking sector returns to... Uh, uh, zero expected profits. Um, and an interesting uh, result is that the pass through of the remuneration rate to the deposit rate now is um, always uh, strictly lower than the case of the short run. And in this uh, numerical example, you also, uh, you also get the possibility that the uh, retail bank deposit rate in the long run can be decreasing in the CBDC remuneration rate. Okay. Um, and you notice that the, the red line, so the long run uh, response to the CBDC remuneration rate uh, kind of stops a little bit to the left of the uh, short run rate. And that's just because I impose this, this condition that there have to be at least two banks. And so this, um, you know, to the right of that, uh, uh, red line, no, um, there's no possibility of two banks uh, making non-negative profits. Okay. Um, 
So yeah, and just to emphasize that it's not always necessarily decreasing, um, but it's always strictly lower this path pass through in the long run than in the short run. Okay, so that's uh, the case with uh, lambda equal to zero, so essentially cutting off the um, uh, expected liquidity, uh, the liquidity shock part of the model. Um, so, because this is quite a short presentation, um, and because it get, the model gets sufficiently complicated when you introduce these liquidity shocks, I'll just kind of highlight the key, um, the key differences between the case with and without liquidity shocks. So, um, when, uh, so the model without liquidity shocks, so if you like the pure IO side of this model, um, the deposit rate is gonna be strictly increasing in the CBDC uh, in, uh, deposit rate in the short run, okay, that's guaranteed, and the existence of long run and short run equilibria uh, are guaranteed at least within this uh, kind of band of uh, interest rates, uh, CBDC remuneration rates that, that uh, I pointed out earlier. So the case where lambda is greater than zero, um, now the, essentially what's happening here is the, the, the cost of introducing a CBDC is larger because of these liquidity risks. Uh, that the banks, uh, so because the cost of um, deposits as a source of liquidity is increasing, um, now you get the possibility that the deposit rate may be decreasing in the CBDC remuneration rate uh, in the short run. Okay, and the reason why is, um, you know, as CBDC market share increases, uh, banks decide actually it's not really worth having de uh, using deposits as a source of liquidity. I'm not gonna raise my deposit rate just to get this more costly source of liquidity. I'm actually gonna lower my deposit rate and get a smaller and essentially substitute uh, away from deposits. Okay, um, and there are also these existence um, problem. Um, so they're not guaranteed and essentially this, um, the economic implications of these uh, existence issues are that um, banks may decide to um, not, it's a little bit uh, imprecise to say they're gonna leave the market, but they're not gonna, they're not going to compete directly against other banks for deposits, right? So we, we're getting to this case where they may choose to operate a local mo monopoly as an alternative uh, uh, equilibrium, which um, I'm not looking at, but in terms of directly competing with other banks for deposits, that won't happen um, at a much lower uh, CBDC remuneration rate when you add in these liquidity costs. Okay, um, yeah, and just, uh, just to conclude, so the emphasis on this paper is just to make the simple point that, that CBDC um, is likely to have an impact on uh, market structure in, in the deposit market. Um, it's likely to increase the concentration of banks because it's a source of extra uh, competition for banks. Um, and, you know, models that don't necessarily have this entry and exit into the banking sector are um, going to overemphasize this pass-through of uh, two deposit rates of the CBDC remuneration rate, right? So the key point or takeaway for this paper is just to cast out on this, um, this idea that's been, been discussed in policy uh, literature a lot, which is this use of uh, CBDC remuneration rate as an extra lever for monetary policy, right? Because it's an extra interest rate that you can, you can uh, if you like, alter the spread between the policy rate and uh, the CBDC remuneration rate. Um, and the stance that I take in this paper is essentially that, that you know, there's, it's um, not necessarily a very good uh, tool to use and it should be used with caution because it's likely to impact uh, the structure uh, the market structure a lot. Okay, um, yeah, and just, I guess, one, one last point to emphasize is that I don't take a stand on welfare in this model. Um, and uh, honestly, I, I would say this is probably the wrong model to think about welfare because, you know, anyone who, who flicks through the, their uh, IO textbook from 
uh, from university looks up the sell-up model, and there are some you know, strange uh, welfare implications in the sell-up model. Okay, so it's probably not, uh, yeah, so essentially just, just for those who maybe don't remember that the sell-up model is increasing in welfare if um, you reduce the number of banks for, or you know, number of uh, uh, firms from the equilibrium number of firms. Right, so in the salad model, there's too, too much entry. So actually, CBDC is going to have this. Uh, the model is going to bias towards CBDC is good, right? Because CBDC drives out, uh, reduces the number of entries, uh, entrants in this market. And in this model, or in the textbook model, that would be good for welfare. It's uh, a pleasure to, to be here in this uh, very interesting session. I'm going to, to talk about uh, stable coins and uh, the financing and, uh, of the real economy. Um, uh, going fast on the first uh, slide because you, you, we all know that the, the, the very rapid growth of the stable coins uh, uh, market uh, cap uh, from, from a relatively recent period, from 2020. Um, I'm going to talk, to focus more on the two uh, main uh, stable coins in, uh, in the paper. So uh, uh, Tether and, uh, and USD, uh, USD coin that you, you see uh, here. Um, and Terra, of course, crashed. You, you all know that in, in May uh, 2022. 20, uh, but the, 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 the trend uh, remain, uh, remain uh, very, uh, very uh, high. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the implication for, for traditional finance and uh, the implication of uh, uh, those uh, stable coins on, uh, on financial stability. So the, the main takeaways of the, the presentation uh, are um, the, the following. I'm going to show you that the, those stable coins, uh, in spite of their relatively uh, small size compared to, to Bitcoin or, or Ethereum, uh, have gained a central place in crypto, in crypto market. Um, the two largest stable coins, Tether and, and USD coin, are both uh, issued by uh, centralized uh, institutions, um, holding reserved assets uh, in fiat currency, in US dollar, to back their, their tokens value. So exactly the, the type of, of models described um, by the two, two first papers. Uh, this destabilization uh, mechanism uh, creates, in fact, a, a direct connection between uh, the crypto market the stable coins and uh, the, the financing of the real economy, uh, in a way, because it creates simply a variation in demand of uh, uh, short-term safe assets, right? Um, and and you, you, you may even think of a situation in which uh, this demand uh, affects firms' financing conditions and financing cho choices, uh, just because um, this, um, this uh, additional demand may create an incentive for, for uh, firms or banks to issue those, those short-term short -term, uh, claims. And we do find in the paper a correlation between these uh, stable coins, uh, token issuance, and commercial paper issuance denominated in, in US uh, dollar. And going forward, the, the, the composition of the asset side of a uh, stable coins uh, issuer uh, is probably key to, to determine the interaction between, uh, between the crypto and, uh, and the real uh, uh, traditional finance uh, work. So um, in this uh, first uh, slide, what we wanted to, to, to show you is um, that the, those stable coins, in spite of their relatively small market capitalization uh, compared to Bitcoin and, uh, and Ethereum, um, are actually um, um, at the center of the, the transaction in the, in the, in the crypto market. So here we, we plotted uh, from uh, uh, um, uh, aggregated transactions um, uh, over one year in between September 2020 and September 21, uh, the average daily volumes exchanged in, uh, in uh, 70, uh, 70 uh, exchanges between uh, a selection of, uh, of uh, crypto, uh, crypto assets, Bitcoin, Ethereum here, um, um, well, we, we, we put Cardano here and uh, three, the three main uh, stable coins here, and, and you also have the US dollar. And uh, it turns out that the three quarters of all transactions are made with stable coins. Right? 
Uh, so, so meaning that the, those transactions are, are not leaving the crypto uh, market. Uh, and they, they, we can say that they, they serve as a, a medium of exchange or a store of liquidity. There are many other explanations between also for, for, for that. One is uh, taxation, right? Because if you stay in the crypto, uh, crypto uh, world, you don't pay uh, taxes on your, on your uh, uh, capital gain. Um, the stabiliza stabilization strategy, how they, the, those stable coins manage the, the peg uh, against the, the US dollar is, uh, is quite important in this, uh, in this paper. So uh, uh, just to, uh, to show you here, that, uh, to remind you that there are a variety of uh, governance and, uh, and stability strategies. So you have centralized uh, stable coins, you have uh, uh, decentralized uh, smart contracts like, uh, like uh, DAI, for instance. And you also have uh, different types of, let's say, balance sheet. So you have uh, Tether and, uh, and, uh, and USD coin that are asset backed, but you also have other stable coins that are just uh, algorithmic or, or uh, collateralized by uh, other crypto, uh, crypto assets. Um, they don't have the same success in uh, maintaining their the peg. And, uh, Luna uh, is, uh, is an excellent case in point. And, uh, and there seems to be a link between the adoption uh, of these uh, crypto, uh, of these uh, stable coins, sorry, and, uh, and uh, their performance in pegging their value to US dollar. So uh, the two largest USDT and, uh, and uh, USD, USDC are centralized and asset backed. They uh, actually uh, have the best peg performance so far, um, uh, uh, far better than uh, algorithmic stable coins, for instance. And um, we tried here to, uh, to also plot um, uh, two types of instruments from, from the, the, the real world, uh, so to speak. So uh, if you look at the, the performance um, of uh, the, the peg of uh, GP uh, uh, Morgan uh, uh, Prime Money Market Fund, it turned out that they, they perform uh, better in terms of uh, maintaining the peg against the US uh, dollar. But uh, peg, peg the currencies like uh, Hong Kong dollars, for instance, tend to, uh, to be uh, uh, less pegged to the US dollar than, than many, many stable coins. Um, so now what I'm, I'm saying that is, is because the, we are going to focus on Tether and USD coin, they, or, or they are both uh, asset backed. And um, what is interesting is to look at the, the asset composition of their, of their asset size. Um, and uh, uh, prior to, 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 uh, to, to the summer last year, there was absolutely no transparency on, uh, on the, the balance sheet of these uh, stable coins uh, issuer. It was only a promise that uh, their tokens were backed one for one with, uh, with US uh, dollar. But hopefully in a, in a, um, a legal action uh, in, uh, in New York forced uh, first uh, teaser to disclose the the accountant reports of their, of their uh, asset side uh, were uh, followed uh, soon by, by USD coin. Um, and, and, and that was quite a surprise for, for people in, in the market because people uh, uh, tend to, to think that uh, uh, the asset side was only, only cash, for instance. But what, what we learned from these reports in that uh, uh, a large part uh, of the asset side was, in fact, in uh, uh, held in, uh, in commercial papers, right? So here in the middle, you see the, the composition of the, the reserved assets of the uh, of a teaser uh, in, uh, in 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 June 20, uh, 2021. Uh, and if you look at the composition of uh, J.P. Morgan uh, Prime Fund, it's more or less the same composition in terms of uh, of asset class. Um, and what is true is that since, uh, since uh, mid-21, uh, um, USDC and uh, USDT tend to, to, to reduce the share of the, the commercial paper uh, in, the, in the asset side. Now, one, one question um, you may ask is um, uh, whether these stable coins are uh, um, too small or, uh, or, um, uh, or big enough to, to have an impact on these, uh, on these markets. Uh, actually, in 21, Teaser uh, com competed with the largest money market fund. It, it was a market money market fund. 
it would uh, rank uh, among the, the, the 10 largest money market funds, uh, almost on par with, uh, with uh, Vanguard, for instance, uh, money market fund. And their holdings in, uh, in uh, commercial paper uh, likely culminated um, around uh, 40 billion dollars in, uh, in 21. Uh, which is um, maybe a small fraction of the total uh, commercial paper outstanding, but still, uh, still uh, uh, quite sizable compared to the to the daily issuance of these uh, of these commercial papers. Um, so not so small. Uh, it also depends on the the willingness of the or the degree of substitution uh, of uh, other investors. Are they willing to uh, to um, uh, uh, to let the, the stable coins uh, demand um, grow and, uh, and themselves uh, rebalance the world or other assets or, or not. So yeah, from, from this, uh, this uh, starting point, you, you, you may think of uh, several type of connection with the, uh, with the economy. Uh, one uh, extreme case is, um, is uh, the, the occurrence of, uh, of runs on the stable coins. So uh, uh, this uh, uh, event might have an impact in the real economy because uh, people uh, holding uh, Terra coins, for instance, make uh, huge losses and then they, uh, they uh, must uh, uh, maybe, uh, uh, they may uh, transmit those losses uh, into the, the real economy. Uh, another type of connection is maybe on the impact on uh, the, the, the traditional finance because there is a uh, a fluctuation of demand for uh, short-term staff assets emanating from uh, stable coins issuer, right? Which may itself be a function uh, of, uh, of crypto market uh, developments like uh, Elon, Elon Musk uh, tweeting some, something on, uh, on Bitcoin or Dogecoin and this is creates uh, uh, fluctuation in, uh, in stable coins and, uh, and, and fluctuation of demand for, for staff assets. This, there might be an uh, impact on, uh, on firms uh, however, risk if they, this new demand uh, induce them to uh, to uh, issue more of this type of, of debt. Right, that's a uh, uh, very classical mechanism. For instance, Stein uh, described in his uh, in his uh, uh, papers, and there are other other uh, connection uh, related more on the impact of uh, safe asset uh, scarcity. But here we are going to focus on uh, on uh, connection two and, uh, and three. Um, um, so if you take yeah, a very uh, naive uh, approach of this uh, question, uh, what did here is just to plot the uh, commercial paper issuance and, uh, and the stable coins uh, token uh, supply. So stable coins here uh, are the, just the two, uh, the two largest ones, Tether and USD, uh, USD coin. Uh, and you, you find this apparent uh, correlation between, uh, between the, the, the two markets. It would be consistent with the a shift in demand due to, uh, to commercial paper, and these new actors um, demanding those, uh, those uh, uh, commercial paper. Um, but of course, uh, there are a lot of possible uh, confounding factors uh, that we need to control for. Um, for instance, monetary policy or excess liquidity, you might think that uh, this would uh, um, create uh, inflows both in commercial paper market and both in, and, uh, and in uh, the stable coins market. Um, there has been a lot also of, uh, uh, of stress in the CP market during the pandemic and so on, so uh, we, we, we need to control for monetary policy. And there might be other uh, much more macro or macro finance uh, common, uh, common factors like uh, uh, risk aversion or risk, risk uh, appetite. So before going to the, to the empirical exercise uh, and how we control for, for that, how we identify the, 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 the regression, just wanted to stop uh, two minutes here on, the, uh, on how we, we can track the changes in, uh, in, the, in the token supply, right? Um, uh, you have uh, multiple of source in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the market, in the web, you can find a lot of uh, information on that. Um, but retracing the, the supply of, uh, of tokens can be done quite, quite easily uh, directly by, uh, by uh, reading the, the blockchain. Um, um, uh, if you do that, you, you find that uh, for Teaser, for instance, uh, there is a, 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 
centralized entity, I mean, it is a treasury uh, in, the, in the smart contract uh, with the, yeah, this type of uh, contract address and, uh, and so on. So you can track the, the activity of this, uh, of this entity um, to see um, the, 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 the decision to mint and to burn to the, in the cryptocurrency uh, jargon, just uh, creation and destruction of, uh, of these tokens. Um, and that are related to uh, the fact that mm, investors or coin holders can, uh, can always redeem uh, tokens for US dollar uh, directly with uh, the Tether treasury. And also uh, Tether treasury uh, itself uh, would mean and burn tokens to, uh, to defend the peg, right? Exactly like, uh, like um, uh, a central bank uh, maintaining a peg, for instance. Um, so the, the difficult part is that some tokens are, are not held by the public, some are uh, uh, um, uh, held uh, directly by Tiza Treasury or Quarantine or such kind of thing. So that, that's the, not, not so trivial to get uh, the, the, the time series we, we look for, uh, which is a net circulating supply, which is uh, in fact really backed by uh, asset in, uh, in, teaser, in teaser balance sheet. Right? Um, so turning to the, to the uh, specifications, we, we do a very standard uh, specification and control similar to other paper uh, investigating the CP, uh, CP market. So at the left hand side, we are interested in the, in the change in uh, issuance uh, of a commercial paper or the change in the, in the rates. Uh, at the right hand side, the main, uh, the main uh, variable of interest would be, uh, would be the, 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 the change in, uh, in token supply uh, by uh, Tether or USD coin or both. Um, and we are going to, to, to control for um, a bunch of, uh, of things uh, related to monetary policy, so Fed fund rates, uh, access reserves, um, the intervention of the Fed on the, CP, on the CP market as well. Um, um, we are going to uh, also include in the, in the controls uh, NASDAQ as a proxy of a, a wider appetite for, for risky assets, for instance, or the, the VIX uh, to capture uh, risk, uh, risk aversion. Um, we, we, we estimate this, uh, this regression in, uh, in first difference. Um, uh, so in fact, it means that we capture the demand of, uh, of uh, commercial paper emanating from, from uh, uh, stable coin issuer the day tokens are, are meeting, meet, minted or, or burnt. But we don't know much about the timing, so I'm, I'm going in two slides uh, show you uh, show you our our strategy. Um, and we um, uh, there are several ways to deal with uh, with, with causality or possible uh, endogeneity uh, bias here. Um, what, we, what we find that those tokens creation and destruction uh, dynamics is really uh, more linked to crypto dynamics. So if, if you look at determinants of these, uh, of these uh, uh, crash and destruction uh, dynamics, it's one, one factor that is uh, uh, um, um, uh, explaining most these, uh, these uh, changes or for instance, the, the profit and loss you make on, uh, on your Bitcoin positions. So we, uh, we think that the, the, the token uh, crash and destruction uh, are quite, uh, quite uh, exogenous, actually. And we, we uh, deploy in the paper several uh, uh, strategies like diff and diff and so on. We're working on, a, on, a, on an IV uh, as well to, uh, uh, to, better, uh, to better deal with, uh, with causality. So the main, uh, the main uh, results uh, here in this, uh, in this table, um, so we, we split the change in, uh, in tokens by uh, Tether and, and USD uh, coin uh, here. The, the control, uh, or uh, as, we, uh, as I, I showed uh, the, the slide before. Um, we also include a, a day of week fixed effect because the, the, the issuance, for instance, of a commercial paper is a, is really um, highly uh, intra-week uh, seasonal, for instance. So we include this in the, as, a, as a control. 
And we do find um, that the, the, the change in, uh, in, uh, in token supply by both USDT and USDC uh, are linked to variation in CP, uh, in CP issuance uh, with uh, different type of effects uh, across maturities, across also uh, ratings and, uh, and, and issuer uh, here. So, uh, so one billion change in, uh, in teaser tokens, for instance, are would be associated with a 1.5 billion change in, uh, in the very short uh, CP issuance um, and, um, and uh, a 0.3 billion change in, uh, in the longer term, higher than, than uh, 80, 80 days CP, uh, CP issuance. Um, so I said that the, the timing of the tokens uh, backing uh, was not, not very transparent. We only have this uh, limited and infrequent information from, from reports. Uh, so we thought that uh, a way to deal with that uh, would be to, uh, to, uh, to do local, uh, local projections to see, uh, to see the dynamic of the, of the uh, impact of, uh, of token supply. But we, we, this suggests strongly that uh, the, the impact is, uh, is really uh, contemporaneous in the, in the CP. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm running out of, of time now. But what we what we uh, do in the paper is also to, to exploit the fact that, uh, as I said, USDC and USDT um, uh, announced or implemented uh, a change in the in the reserve asset composition. So we know at some point of time they, they stopped investing uh, in uh, in the CP market. So we try to use that. In, uh, in a quasi definitive setup uh, to, uh, um, to test if the, um, the significance disappear when they, when they stop investing in the CP market. And we, we find uh, results that are quite, quite intuitive. Here is the, the coefficient for teaser, for instance, and the teaser stopped uh, backing the, 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 the token in the CP market in, uh, um, in the first semester of 2022. Uh, uh, we do falsification tests with the third uh, largest uh, stablecoin, which is uh, Binance USD. Um, uh, never uh, back the tokens with, uh, with CP, so it's a good, good candidate for, for a falsification test. And we don't find uh, any significance on, uh, on CP issuance for, for BUSD. So to, to wrap up very uh, rapidly, we uh, we identify one very particular mechanism connecting crypto and, uh, and uh, the, the real economy uh, through the, the Sabal coins uh, reserve assets. Um, uh, there has been much attention on the, the crash of Terra or this kind of event, these runs, but we, we think that maybe it's not the, the most important connection, uh, uh, a very dramatic connection, but maybe not, not necessarily the, the most important one between uh, crypto and uh, traditional finance uh, because there is uh, an intimate link between, uh, between uh, uh, CP issuance and, uh, and stable demand, for instance. So how this, this connection uh, uh, may uh, evolve? Maybe going to, to fat by itself because, uh, as I said, uh, stable coins are moving away from, from CP market. But at the same time, they, um, they increase their exposure to other assets like, like T-bill or bank deposits and it creates Another type of connection, another type of implication for uh, regulation, for instance, or, or monetary policy. Uh, this is going to depend also on the size of these uh, crypto and stable coins uh, markets and also the type of uh, stabilization uh, strategy that will become dominant in the, in the future. Um, uh, of course, CBDC are, are uh, an alternative, so the, the competition between the two is, uh, is really uh, key. In terms of regulation, well, uh, regulation uh, may uh, probably foster the transparency of the, uh, the stablecoin business. Uh, they may uh, want to align stablecoins with, with banks or with, with money market funds. Uh, but this would not uh, break the connection of stablecoins to the, to the economy, or at least this uh, uh, particular uh, connection. So uh, that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And uh, looking forward to your question and comments. So, thanks a lot to the Bank of Lithuania for including this program in the session. So it's a joint paper with Adrian Davernar and Vincent Morin, both at the Stockholm School of Economics. 
And the title is Can Stablecoin Be Stable? Okay, so um, I think I can, by this time, I can probably free ride on the motivation from others' paper. So I'm going to completely skip that slide and tell you about what's our uh, vantage point on what's um, a stablecoin. So we think about the stablecoin as being a new technology to solve an old problem. And the old problem is something like a private bank or a, a government or a country that wants to create some money, that have the power to create some money, and that tends to run into some issue that um, there's a time inconsistency like ex post, you always have an incentive to issue a little bit too much. Um, and so that's a problem that ex ante you would like to be able to solve. Um, we think that what stablecoins bringing to the table is um, a couple of technological improvements in that, in that uh, problem, in solving that problem. The first one is that with using algorithmic contracts, you can uh, use that as a commitment technology to actually do the issuance or to, to restrain the issuance in the future already by today. The, the second one, and I think this one's going to be important to understand what's um, um, a purely algorithmic stablecoin, is, is the fact that this stablecoin can do this uh, low-cost continuous issuance and redemption of equity shares or equity tokens. And that's going to be very important because usually we think about the problem of managing a peg as being uh, how much do you manage, how do you manage your reserves in the system? And then the big question is how does a purely algorithmic stablecoin that does not hold any assets can maintain a peg, even just locally? And part of the answer would be that they can do this instantaneous um, buyback of a stablecoin by issuing some equity shares, which effectively are a claim to future sustainable revenues of the platform. Okay, and then the third one is that this stablecoin can also decentralize the issuance to a third party, to some other agents that uh, might have different incentives um, of, of, of issuance. So this could also be used as, as a substitute for the commitment technology. And we're going to explore these three spaces. And so also interestingly, this, this new technology and the way this, they've been implemented led to a couple of different designs. So we already discussed that many are actually the most successful stablecoins um, have been backing reserves, or have been backing the, the issuance directly with reserves in dollars, but we also have other propositions that are using some crypto asset directly on the blockchain as collateral, backing the value of the stablecoin. And then even more surprisingly, as we discussed already, we have these algorithmic stablecoin that don't have any collateral at all. Um, the issuance also will vary, sometimes will be fully dis discretionary, sometimes going to be algorithmic based. And then we have like a different ways that the pegging mechanism are described in the reality. We'll actually argue that many of these things can be uh, coined within the same framework. Okay, so uh, the goal of this paper will be to provide a framework that allows us to understand uh, stablecoin in the most general fashion as possible. And our approach will be to start from a monopolist platform that issues stablecoins that cater to investors' liquidity de demand. Um, and we are going to assume that the platform has a, a limited commitment to its policies, and that's going, that's going to matter. So, okay, so there are really two points here. The first one is that investors are going to enjoy a convenience yield whenever they hold some stablecoin. Here again, we don't take a particular stance why this can be, but it can be because they want to finance illegal activities, because they are in a foreign country and they want to dollarize, it's some, something like that. Um, and then in order to maintain the peg, the, the, um, the stablecoin platform will act as a central bank, meaning that in a, when, the, when the demand contracts, the stablecoin platform will need to repurchase some of the stablecoin so that the demand always equals the supply exactly where the price equals to one. So you need to do this dynamic supply adjustment as a reaction to the demand function. And uh, as, as we are going to see, this is not always uh, time consistent. So we are going to explore a range of different commitment technology, and we'll start with like the, um, a, a full commitment setting where the, the platform can fully commit to doing all of these issues based on observables in the economy. Uh, and then we are going to relax that uh, going forward and see like lower um, or weaker forms of commitments in the paper. Okay, so our, fir our first and main result of this paper is that even with the, full, with, with the strongest form of commitment, even with full commitment, 
you can only, only uh, maintain a local pack. You're never going to have like a stablecoin platform that's not fully collateralized, uh, that, is fully, that is fully stable. So, so, so these platforms are inherently instable. Um, so we are going to study uh, the smart contracts, collateralization, and decentralization within our, our program. OK, so uh, let me move on to the modern. And I'll start with the balance sheet representation, because I think for us, economists are actually useful. So when you read the white papers, you're not going to have something like that. But it's actually a very simple uh, way of thinking about what's a stablecoin. So a stablecoin is something that looks like a bank. A stablecoin platform looks like a bank. It issues some stablecoins, which is a liability of the platform. And then it does that by sometimes using some collateral. And, and sometimes also backing this uh, stablecoin uh, using the future senior revenue that the platform is going to generate. Uh, and then that also generates the difference between the assets and the liability of this platform is going to be the value of the market value of the equity of the platform, which is going to be traded uh, with these equity tokens. So now we are going to look at the valuation of both the stablecoin but also the equity token. OK, so let's start with the stablecoin demands. Uh, the model is going to be in continuous time. All agents have a discount rate R and are fully risk neutral. Um, we make the assumption that the investor derives some benefits from holding the stablecoin. And we write the mar this marginal benefit as L, which will depend on A, which is the demand of stablecoin, and the quantity of stablecoin that is in the, in the economy. So it's a reduced form approach. So like, think about it as money in the utility uh, kind of approach. OK, we make three assumptions on this demand for stablecoin. The first one is that the demand is strictly increasing in this exogenous demand driver A. Uh, and I'm going to specify what's the process for this exogenous driver in the next slide. Second, uh, I make the assumption also that you only get these marginal benefits when the stablecoin is actually pegged to the value. When it's not pegged, then what's the point of holding a stablecoin if it's not stable? And then we'll make also a bunch of um, technical assumptions don't really matter uh, for here. OK, so that's the process for the exogenous demand driver. So it's going to follow um, a stochastic process which has both, um, at the same time, a drift, a Brownian motion component, and also a Poisson uh, jump process. The Poisson jump process uh, has an arrival and intensity of lambda. And the size of the jump, which is going to be this ST, will be distributed between 1 and 0. And we make the assumption that it's actually that the log the minus the log of this uh, jump is exponentially distributed with the parameter zeta. So to fix ideas, if you want to think about what this uh, exogenous demand driver could be, one example would be Bitcoin, so the value of Bitcoin. So we tend to think, think about um, stable coins as being the money market funds of the cryptocurrency markets. So it, seems to be that in the data, when Bitcoin or the, the value of other cryptocurrency increases, then the demand for stablecoin also increases along with that. But that doesn't really matter. If you don't like this explanation, just think about this A as being the demand. OK, so platform policy. The, we have three main policies, and we're going to hold that during the, all of the paper. The first one is that the stablecoin um, platform chooses how much it, uh, it issues or redeem or um, uh, mint or burns within the, the stablecoin parlance of the stablecoin at, at each point in time. And that we are going to denote that variable as DGT. Uh, then the stablecoin has to choose how much interest rate it pays uh, to the stablecoin holders. Uh, that's going to be the delta T. And an important point here is that the, the stablecoin platform is going to pay this interest rate in stablecoin. Stablecoin is not going to use like to make a bank transfer. It's going to just create some more stablecoin and credit that to that to the account. And then the third point is that the platform can also choose uh, a collateralization rule. And for simplicity, we assume that this collateralization rule is actually constant. So at the initiation of the platform, you choose how much collateral uh, you need to hold whenever you create one new uni unit of stablecoin. Which means that we have a law of motion for stablecoin that looks like this. Uh, you have two components here. The first one is that you need to take into account how much issuance or redemption is done at a given point in time. But then you also need to take into account that you need to create new stable coins in order to pay for the interest rates. That's the second term. Then we have a law of motion for how much collateral is held within the platform. 
and that will depend on, on the growth rate of the collateral uh, here and then on the collateralization on, on how much collateral you put at each point in time, which itself depends on the collateralization rule that you set up at the beginning. And we later introduced this summarization. I'll, I'll have a couple of words at the very end of the presentation. Okay, first we look at what happens whenever you have a full commitment, when you can actually write a smart contract that tells you that completely ties your hands on how much issuance and redemption you are going to do. And the first step within this full uh, commitment uh, uh, chapter is actually to look at what we call an unlimited, un unlimited commitment benchmark. In this case, I'm not only assume, uh, going to assume that you, you, you can tie your hands on the and redemption, but I'm also going to assume that you can tie your hands on the recapitalization of the platform, meaning there is no limited liability, and we are going to use that as a, as a benchmark. So the idea here is that you can pledge more that, it, that is already in the platform at the given point in time. Okay, so the problem looks like this one. So the platform wants to maximize the value of its future senior revenues, which is how much stablecoin you actually issue, minus uh, all of the interest rates that you, you have to pay, and, and, and plus um, taking into account how much the value of the collateral asset is going to grow uh, in time. You do that subject to the a pricing equation for the stablecoin itself, which is priced competitively by the other agents in the economy which value the stablecoin for two reasons. The first reason is that they get the liquidity benefits conditional on the stablecoin being pegged. And the second one is that they get these interest rates. Um, and subject to the law of motion, subject to the fact that you start the platform with nothing, and we also impose a no, pon no Ponzi game condition uh, to that program. Okay, so with just a little bit of math, we can basically use this equation in order to substitute in that equation, simplify a little bit, and then we get this nice expression where we see that the senior revenues can actually be decomposed into two terms. The first one is just the marginal liquidity uh, times the quantity of stablecoin that, that is in the economy. And then the second term here is going to be the cost for the platform uh, of holding the collateral, which is, which is going to hold because we make the assumption that the return on the collateral assets that is completely risk-free is less than the risk-free rate in the economy because it itself generates some uh, senior revenues. Okay, so uh, in that case, when the, this problem actually very much looks like a monopoly that maximizes the total value of the liquidity benefits, or its franchise value. And in order to do that, it will act as a monopoly and it will restrict the quantities of stablecoin to make sure that uh, the, the, its profit is maximized. Okay, so first result is that even uh, in this full uh, commitments, unlimited commitment benchmark, you always have a zero price equilibrium. Uh, and the reason for that is basically the same as in most uh, fiat money uh, models. It's just that there's really no anchor for the price of a given asset. And the reason is that if, um, if you start from uh, thinking that the price is zero, then that means that the, all of the interest rates in stablecoin that you will receive are also worth zero. That also means that you don't get the liquidity benefits. So basically, like the zero value is always a fixed point uh, in this equation. Okay, uh, but more interestingly, when you have this unlimited commitment benchmark, you also have another equilibrium that, that is actually stable. And in that stable equilibrium, uh, we have the following property. The, the, the value of the stablecoin will be such that in equilibrium, the quantity of stablecoin will be such that the monopolies maximize the value of, uh, of the um, uh, franchise value of the firm, and then that means that anything that deviates through that, to that particular point, is going to be exactly compensated. So you do this issuance and redemption rule in order to make sure that you always remain at C star, and C star itself depends on the quantity of demand. So basically what happens is that if demand increases, then you issue more, if demand decreases, then you, then you uh, redeem, the, or, you, uh, or you buy back some of the stable coins so that you're always at C star. Um, uh, you can also express that as a ratio between the demand and the quantity of stable coin outstanding, which is this A star, and you always stay there, basically. Um, how do you choose the interest rate that you want to pay? Well, you just choose these interest rates so that you actually peg the price to parity so that you actually generate these uh, similar revenues. In this case, it's also, there's no point of having any collateral because collateral is risky. 
And because you have unlimited commitments, the platform is always stable. OK, so now let's look at the more interesting case, which is that, and more realistic one, which is that you cannot pledge um, to do a recapitalization of the platform. Because doing a recapitalization of the platform means that you bring money from one side of the blockchain back on the blockchain. So that's something, that's something we can really do here. And that's just a version of limited liability. When that's the case, then this second equilibrium is going to be only locally stable. Because what's going to happen is that if you have very, very large or very large shocks, that might be enough for the platform to become undercapitalized. And when that's the case, the platform will be fully committed to issue more of this equity token um, in order to do the buyback of the stable coins. But if the value, if at that point the value of the equity is zero, you can issue as much as you want of this equity token, you're never going to be able to buy back, to do the buyback operations. And if you do that, then you lose the pack. So we really have like this two region equilibrium where if you are above a threshold, you do as before. You, you, you are going to do all of the repurchasing so that you remain at the optimal point. But then when you are below, you just, uh, you just have to lose the pack because there is nothing you can do. Um, and then not, not of, some, some, something else that's interesting is that the C star, so the, the target quantity of stablecoin that you, that you do in this, in this case is going to be different because you're also going to take into account that there is a risk that you lose the pack. And for that reason, because you don't want to be uh, losing the pack, you're going to take a little bit of a buffer. Okay, so that's something we can see graphically here. Um, so what, what we have here, we have the equity as a function of A. So A is the, being this ratio between the demand for stablecoin and the quantity of stablecoin outstanding. Here is the price of the stablecoin. Here is the total value of the platform. In black, I have the value, uh, sorry, I have, I have the case with um, unlimited commitments. So in unlimited commitment, we see it can go to negative e uh, um, uh, equity and the price is always packed. So that's really our benchmark case. Okay, the interesting case is what's going on with this blue case. The blue case is such that anything that's on the right to this bubble uh, point here is the jump back region. So you're going to stay here at the star, and then if you move a little bit on the right, on the left, you're going to jump back instantaneously to C star. Unless if you have a very large shock, if you have a very large shock that moves you beyond this bubble point, if you move there, then you end up being in a region where the equity value of the equity is zero. Then you, you, can, you, you want to create some more of this equity token, but you're, not, you're, not, you're already fully diluted, so there is nothing you can do. You have to lose the pack. And so that's why the pack starts being lost at this bubble point here. And we also see that the value of this platform that doesn't have this full commitment is lower than the value of the, of, of the other platform. OK, so let me just skip that in the interest of time. Let me just mention that quickly. So this is a graph for what happened with Terra, and we think it's kind of consistent with the story I just, I just mentioned before. So we see that the price of Terra was pegged for a long time, and then uh, around uh, May uh, of this year started tanking. And then we see that at exactly at the same time, the price of the Luna, this equity token, also fell dr uh, drastically. And, and that exactly happened where, at the time where the, the Luna platform was actually doing what it's supposed to do, which is to, to create or to mint much more Luna exactly at that time. But what, what we see here is that this doesn't seem to be enough because the price completely of the Luna completely converged to zero. And as the price completely converged to zero, you basically reach like an, as, an asymptote here. You can create billions and billions of things that are worth, worth zero. There's no, no way you can use that to reduce the supply, and then the peg is lost. OK, so let me skip that as well uh, and just mention, um, move to the limited commitment uh, part of the paper. So in this case, until now, I assume that you can always fully commit on uh, the issuance and redemption you can do. But in reality, many of these platforms, they don't want to do that because then if there is a bug in your, in your algorithm, you, there is nothing you can do anymore. So it's, it's useful to retain some flexibility over what you can do. So here what we find is that even if you cannot commit fully to the issuance and redemption, being able to commit only on this um, uh, interest rate rule might be enough to generate some, some local stability. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that you can basically use this um, commitment on the interest rate in order to incentivize yourself um, to do the repurchase. 
if the interest rates are, if, if you move to a region where interest rates are too high for you to pay, then suddenly it becomes profitable for you to do the buybacks, which is something that we typically don't see in this literature. So all these papers on the leverage ratchet effect from Admeti and I and Domazo, uh, they always assume that there is a, you have a, a constant uh, interest rate rule, a constant interest rate, and if you have constant interest rates, then you cannot use that, and then that means that you're never going to do the buybacks. But if you can create this uh, rule that is state contingent, then you can incentivize yourself in the future to do the right thing. Uh, but even though you do that, the type of platform, the value of the platform that you can create is going to be much lower than what we've seen earlier. And I see I'm running, running out of time, so let me just mention what the result that we have for decentralized platform. So in the decentralized case, what we had is that now you can decentralize the issuance to another agent. Um, and, and that's going to be useful for the platform because now the platform uh, is not in charge anymore of this, 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 this uh, issuance and redemption anymore. Um, and so that's, that's going to remove the time inconsistency problem in, in this case. So basically the idea is that by uh, decentralizing to uh, the issuance process, you replace this issuance uh, redemption function by um, a free entry condition. And the free entry condition is going to determine how much stablecoin is available at any point in time. But the platform is still going to retain control on the interest rate it, it uh, charge or pays to stablecoin users and how much fees, here ST in this equation, it charges to vault uh, owners. And, and by doing that, the platform is still going to decide uh, eventually how much interest rates will be um, outstanding at any given point in time. But the main difference with what we had before is that the profit that you re realize by uh, creating this stablecoin is not going to, uh, uh, to accrue at the time of the creation, but rather as a flow during the time where the platform actually lives. Uh, and it's going to be coming like from this spread between how much fees you get from the vault owners and how much interest rate you pay to the stablecoin users. And that's basically a way to implement uh, the, the leasing uh, solution uh, in the durable good monopolies problem of uh, Cause 9072 for the ones that have that, that paper in mind. Okay, so let me wrap up because I think I'm already out of time. So um, in this paper, we have like this general model of stablecoin and we find out that a platform that um, even with full commitment but limited liability, you on, only have a locally stable equilibrium. There's always a uh, risk that the platform completely falls apart and the peg is lost. Uh, we find that with no commitments on restaurant redemption, you can still have something that's locally stable, but that's only if you can create this uh, interest rate rule that is state contingent. We find out that uh, decentralization can act as a substitute for the commitment technology, and that's something I didn't spend too much, I did not really have the time to show you, is that we also find that quartalization rule uh, is very helpful, but because it's costly, uh, that might not be optimal for the platform to actually uh, implement the full quartalization uh, setting. And uh, that's it for my presentation.